Hey, Connect Church, uh, PD here. Well, I'm here, you're there. Let me try to explain that real quick. Uh, listen, I was supposed to be with you in Ashland in person, so I'm sorry about that. I am stuck in sunny Florida, suffering for Jesus. It's horrible. I know you guys just immediately dropped your knees, feeling bad for me, but don't feel too bad. It's, it's pretty good. But because of the storm there, man, they canceled flights for the whole weekend, so I am coming to you in Ashland uh, this way. And of course, all our campuses, I wanna bring a big shout out. Our online campus, I wanna say hello to you. I wanna say hello to all our Facebook viewers, our YouTube viewers. But in particular, all of our physical locations, the Fram Fam, as we like to say, Framingham, and of course, our new location, Tri-County, which is having its practice service today, we are streaming live there as well. So, so glad to be with you guys this morning. We are in a series, which I'm going to get into in just a second, but... I really just need to have like a a pastoral moment. I need to bring you in, need you guys to lean in just a little bit here because when you look at current events, it would be remiss of me not to say something about what is happening in our world today. If you are not up to speed, uh, Russia has invaded and attacked Ukraine. Yeah, I know, this is a crazy time. And I don't know if you guys like see things the way I do, but I want to encourage you to get into your Bibles because a lot of the things that are happening right now, listen, they're really in Scripture, unpacked for us. And we're kind of in a sequence where at some point in the not too distant future, we don't know for sure, but we do know it's soon. Uh, Jesus is coming back. And so if you read in Matthew chapter 24, it says there will be wars and rumors of wars. It also talks about pestilences on the earth. How many know we just kind of experienced a pandemic pestilence that is so clear uh, that everybody would have to agree that's what that was. But now we're experiencing a war and we haven't seen this for quite some time. And uh, I have friends who have family and friends in the Ukraine, pastors that I actually pastor who are from there. And I just want to pray for just a minute or two for them. And I'd like you guys to just kind of join me. Um, And I'm really not sure how this will come out. So I ask that you guys just join me in heart and mind. Father, I pray for all of those people in that part of the world. Gosh, we can't even relate. Sometimes because of the exposure we have to global events. We become desensitized. Our hearts become even callous to what it would be like to be bombed in our city or to, you know, have to leave and abandon our homes for fear. Lord, I pray for all those people that need you so bad right now. I pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Lord, for friends and family that are here in the United States, Lord, I pray you release them from anxiety and from fear. Lord, I thank you that in your word it says that these signs that are coming tell us to look up because redemption draweth nigh. But Lord, uh, I just pray for those people having a hard time doing that right now and help us know how to help them. Speak to us individually, speak to us corporately, and speak to your church. What can we do to help all those people at this time? Lord, I lift them up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, just keep them in your prayers. Keep them really close to your heart right now. Um, and, um, you know, it's, if it's not personal, sometimes we don't take it too seriously. Let's not let it come to that where we take those things seriously. Amen. Listen, we're in a series and this is uh, perhaps the last week. We might have one more next week on the subject of unity. Now, kind of kicked off this series on our Vision Sunday talking about an aspect of unity that maybe some of you have never heard before. We talked about uh, the speed of unity. Listen, we're living in a day where things are kind of speeding up a little bit. The days are evil, the Bible says, time is short. So when time gets shorter, things tend to get a little bit faster. But interestingly enough, sometimes the church kind of downshifts or, or gets to barely a crawl, sometimes a stall. And so we talked about the different speeds of ministry and life that there is, if we're we're moving at all, there is walking in agreement, right? That you can be in agreement, but it's just walking. And it's not fast enough. It's good, but it's not fast enough. And then I always thought the next speed, the best speed, was the speed of vision. The Bible tells us in Habakkuk that you're supposed to run with the vision. And I love that, and that's really, really good. But there's a different speed. And that is the speed of unity. That's when we can do more. We can go further, faster. 
And so you don't want to miss it. That was week one. Week two, we talked about one body. So the speed of unity, week one. Week two, one body. We all learned that we all are a part of something, and we've been invited when we accepted Jesus. Whether you knew this or not, you didn't just get this vertical thing worked out. You got this horizontal invitation to be a part of something bigger than just me, myself, and I. That there's no I and we. That we have something that we're supposed to accomplish on the earth together. And you have a part in the body of Christ. And when you know your part, and uh, in fact, you know your part best when you are connected to somebody else's part. So a lot of times people will say to me, and you've probably said this maybe to someone else at a certain juncture in your spiritual journey, where you say, you know, I just don't feel God anymore. I had a friend, I told you this last week, and when he got saved, right after that he got baptized, and he, he was, he's a Latin, so he said, Pastor, I got baptized. And, but when I got baptized, I felt God. But then after I got baptized, time went by and I, I don't feel God anymore. And I don't feel like I'm growing. And I'm going to get out of that accent because I'm really bad at it. But I don't feel like I'm growing. I don't feel, uh, you know, like I, I know what I'm supposed to do. I, I don't feel, I know my purpose. So he didn't feel God. He couldn't grow. He couldn't find his purpose because he wasn't a part of something bigger than himself. So we learned the strength of being one body. Everybody say one body. Type it in the chat. Uh, some of you may want a new body. We'll get that when we get to heaven. But right now we're called to be one body. We are stronger together. So if you're feeling weak in your body, come join with other people and let's accomplish more together. Now, this series is based on a prayer that Jesus prayed. In John chapter 17, he had this prayer. It was called the, it's a kind of big words, but it's the high priestly prayer, right? And Jesus, in essence, is talking to his, his dad. He's talking to his dad and he's saying, Dad, I wish that they, or like my wife would say, y'all down here could be like you and me. Like how we're one, I want, I want my disciples to be one. But he wasn't just praying for his disciples. He was praying for all of us who would come after him. He was praying for you and me to be one. So this whole idea, why, why would he want us to be one? Because he said then, when we're one, then the world would know that you sent me. They would come to believe that I am, in fact, the Son of God, the Messiah. That's why he prayed that. And how many know we need that because we are living in a world that is not one, it's divided. In fact, there's more divisions than probably any time, certainly in my lifetime. I don't remember seeing more divisions than I see right now. You see, you see divisions, of course, we see them related to the pandemic. We're all kind of exhausted from it. We're, we're tired of the masks. You know, one person feels like if I wear it, it's a violation of my freedom. Another person would say not too long ago, well, that's an affront to my health. We, 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 had, we had divisions over how people were handling the virus, how officials are handling the virus, how, how regions of the country are handling the virus, how the president's handling the virus, and so on and so on. Division, 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 division about authority. You know, we, we, don't really, we don't really see authority the same way right now towards the police. And now, really, in a major way, division where countries are coming up against countries. But disagreement is not new, everybody. Disagreement has been there since the dawn of time. What's, what's the problem is, is that people are drawing lines in the sand. People are basically saying, listen, if you think that, uh, you know, then I, I, can't, I can't be in relationship with you. I can't work with you anymore. We're, you're going to have to work someplace else. I can't um, go to the holidays with you anymore. I can't, um, you know, uh, uh, do life with you. I can't go to your church anymore. The, the lines that are being drawn are what is new. Disagreement isn't new. We just can't agree to disagree anymore and still be in relationship. And that attitude, I would submit spirit, has creeped into the church of Jesus Christ. Where I think, first of all, I think it breaks the heart of God. Because I think God is like, listen, there should ever be a place where we could model and we could message unity. It ought to be the church. Can I have an amen from somebody out there? And so here's what I believe kind of as an opening thought, kind of a contributor. And this is like a physical principle, but it's really more a relational principle. So I know you'll see it uh, through the physical first, but distance creates opportunity for division. See, if we're to be one, 
husband and wife are to be one. The Bible actually refers to the husband and wife in the book of Genesis as like um, ish and isha, but it means hand and glove. It doesn't mean they're perfectly opposite each. It doesn't mean opposite. It means perfectly opposite. They're just like they, 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 they're hand in glove. But when husband and wife are, are separated, that's when it opens up the opportunity for division and all kinds of things to come in to create a lot of conflict and problems. And so now you have in relationship, for example, in this principle, you have suspicion comes in. Um, you have... Uh, you have people that have questions. Now, questions in and of themselves are not bad. In fact, questions are good. But the attitude behind and the spirit behind the questions, that becomes the problem. And, and you have a different basic assumption. Oh, I don't feel like you have anything to add by your point of view. I actually uh, wholeheartedly disagree and I'm offended by uh, a different point of view. And so man, man is losing, in a sense, its innocence and it's becoming... Uh, and, and it has a negative assumption when there is that distance. I call it the sin of assumption. When you don't have the information, people tend to fill in the blanks with something bad or something negative. Uh, Jesus addressed this problem in Matthew chapter 12, and I think it's in your notes, Matthew 12, 25, kind of our today text. It says this, Jesus knowing their thoughts. Okay, so he's, he's dealing with uh, uh, the religious here, and he says to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Isn't this interesting in the days we're in? And every city or household, I like to use the word household as it relates to the church, not just like a family, but the family of God. Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Now you might not have read that in your Bible. You might have heard this from your history books. Abraham Lincoln had this great speech called The House Divided. And he was basically running for president. He was going to be the 16th president of the United States. And he used this speech and he basically said, listen, in essence, there was one group of the nation that was for slavery and another one that was not. And he said, if we cannot get together on this, if we cannot become one, our country will be divided. And sure enough, it was. Now we don't have an American Civil War but I do think we have a social civil war that we're in today. And many have lost their minds, really. Many have lost their civility, where we cannot be in relationship with people that we don't agree with wholeheartedly. That's ridiculous. I've been in relationship with my wife for 30 years, and there's still tons of stuff we don't agree with, which we'll talk about as we get together. But our big idea, write this down, is anything divided is defeated. Anything divided is defeated. And the enemy knows this. I mean, in fact, he's the master. So instead, a master of disaster, if he, uh, uh, you know, can divide us, he can conquer us. And that's why it's so important we be united. We talked about this last week. We need to be united, not just because of our bloodline in Jesus Christ. You know, we have the same DNA. Uh, we, or we're brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what Jesus did for us. We talked about that. We also talked about we're united in vision. But another way and another thing that unites us is a common enemy, a common enemy. And Satan is trying to deceive and he's trying to distort truth and he's trying to get us to assume the worst and he's ultimately trying to divide us as the body of Christ. And as we proceed, and I'm contextualizing this for Connect Church because we are moving and we are multiplying right now. We're launching a new campus. Come on somebody. On uh, Next weekend is our official launch of our Tri-County campus. I'm so pumped. Proud of you, Dev, and your team, and Justin, and Mike, and all those great leaders over there. You guys are killing it. But as we do, we, we're not dividing. We are multiplying as one. And it's going to be so important that we stay unified around three thoughts. So I want you to, I want you to take note of these three unifying thoughts. Number one, remember this. Understand this, and this is kind of gives us some motivation and incentive. Unity, understand that the power, there's power, I should say, in unity. The power is in unity. So if you're going to accomplish whatever you need to accomplish in Tri-County, Framingham, whatever needs to be accomplished there in the Framingham region, whatever needs to happen in Ashland, whatever needs to happen uh, beyond us through uh, the Internet and beyond, it's going to happen as we are united. Remember the text that we read in week one from Genesis 11, the story of the Tower of Babel. Now look what was happening. Uh, these people, the Bible says, were one language. That's really critical. In order for us to have... Uh, 
core values and a behavior uh, that is similar, we have to have a united language. But it says that they, they said to each other, let's, let's kind of make something for ourselves. Come, let us build ourselves a city. Now you can see their motivation was impure. They didn't have a holy ambition. They had a selfish one. And it says, with the tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. So a lot of these motivations are really bad. They're real self-serving. Otherwise, we're gonna be scattered everywhere. But the Lord came down, he saw the city and the tower that they were building, and he said, this is the first thing he said. He didn't say, that's dumb, you shouldn't be doing that, that's sinful. No, he said, if as one people, everybody say one people, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. We must understand that there is power in unity. Yes, their ambition was wrong, but the principle still holds true that unity multiplies power. Unity multiplies power. You guys went to school, right? You remember when, I don't know, uh, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, you were doing addition and subtraction, right? Three plus three, three plus three equals six, and three minus three equals zero. You're going through that. But then somewhere around third, fourth, some of you guys maybe a little later, third, fourth, you started learning your multiplication tables and three times three equals nine. Now we're starting to get into this principle of multiplication. And that multiplication principle is directly connected to unity, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Unity is, in fact, multiplicative, and this principle is totally a part of the kingdom of God. And God saw there's nothing that could stop them because they were united, and so he had to break them up at the language level. Now, we see this in sports. We see this in teams. We see this in, I remember, uh, you know, one of my favorite, my favorite sports is probably basketball. Although I'm, I'm recently liking arm wrestling. I don't know what the heck's going on. Late, late lives. I love golf. Different things change. But growing up, it was basketball. And, and one of the players that I've always admired as an individual was Kyrie Irving. Now, Kyrie Irving has got handles like for days. This boy can tear it up on the court, but he could never win games. He could never close them out. He could never get to the next level. He could never win a championship. And so coaches know this. Great coaches know that the best teams don't always have the most talented players. They have players that learn how to, in fact, work together, recognize each other's strengths, celebrate their differences, learn sometimes to selflessly serve each other on the team. That's why I love my favorite, my favorite era of basketball was in the 80s, but the 86 Celtics. If you look at the roster of the 86, yes, it had Larry Bird, but after that, the, a lot of these players weren't known, but boy, could they play ball together. And this is true in your marriages. This is true if you cannot learn to come together and be united. This is true in business. This is true in teams. And, and this is true, guys, in Connect Church. We've got to learn how to come together. It's like uh, uh, just a little while ago, some of you guys know I sold my house, you know, riding the market. Couldn't pass it up. Thank Jesus, Stacy said yes. We could, we could move on. And it was, it was, it was epic because we were in our house for almost 18 years. But when we're moving into our new home, moving is not fun. Moving is not fun at all. Moving furniture is not fun at all. And, um, you, you know, you always get targeted as the big guy to move stuff, you know. And, um, you know, we, when you want to flex your, your strength, you don't get to do that. But when it comes time to some hard work and sweat and lugging things up, upstairs, you're always the one that gets, gets, the, gets the task. But to get things done, it's about people uh, working together, uh, moving in the same direction, right? So if we're getting ready to move a huge couch or you're getting ready to move a, hu a huge bed or something like that you, you basically you've got to figure if we figure out this idea that if we can work together and not kind of oppose each other if we're going in different directions and i'm using my strength and i'm going this way and pulling that way and this person's using their strength and they're going this way and pulling that way what happens in that situation the most forceful person wins or the strongest person wins but because we're going in different directions we we're not moving very fast. In fact, we're probably moving very, very slow. And so just because something or someone is strong doesn't necessarily mean it's best. It's best when I can take my power, I can work together with you, and we go in the same direction. When we do this, 
we move further, faster. Look how aligned the early church was. We looked at Genesis 11. Now let's look at Acts chapter 2. In 11 of Genesis, chapter 11 of Genesis, we see a selfish ambition. In Acts chapter 2, we see a holy ambition. We see God is up to something good, and these people are about it. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers... They were, they were moving furniture together, everybody. They were playing ball together. And they had, the scripture says, everything in common. Everything. How up for you, how up for you are, are you, how up for this, excuse me, are you? Are you someone who would get excited about this kind of uh, idea, this kind of, it's really a movement here more than it is a meeting that people are having where people are like literally just throwing their possessions in and throwing their plans in and everybody's like, hey, if you need something, you can have it. And if I need something, I can grab it. And, and, and the Bible says that they met together every single day. They continued to meet together in, in, in the house and, and in the, in the, and in the house of God, in homes, and in the church. And they met together, not just on a weekly basis. How many know that our churches are going in different directions now? People are kind of like one in, people that consider themselves members of the local church, statistically are going maybe one in every four weeks. That's not unity, everybody. Unity should have more, more uh, meetings together than ever before. There should be more connections and more, uh, um, um, relationship taking place and transpiring than any other time if we're going to get things done for the kingdom of God. This was the early church dynamics, and as a result, it, it grew really, really fast. No wonder God moved so mightily because, because unity multiplies power. If you've ever been in a relationship on the other side of success where it's failing and it's not working out so good and there's problems and there's fighting and there's conflict, what happens? We're not moving. It's, it's, tear, it's tearing apart. It's destructive. It's stalled. You don't feel like anything is moving forward if you've been in a relationship like that. And by the way, I just have to say this. Not all division is bad. Not all uh, division is wrong. And this may help some of you because sometimes there comes a time where it's appropriate to separate. It's appropriate uh, to divide on some occasions. And you got to go your separate ways. But you should do this after much prayer, um, much effort. The Bible talks about this in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, that you, you want to do as far, as much as depends on you, you try to live peaceably with people and, and, and go all out. And, of course, you want to receive counsel. So a lot of times people will hear a piece of advice like, oh, see, Pastor D said it's okay once in a while to divide. Sometimes you have to separate. But they haven't really gone through the other biblical prescriptions for reconciliation. They haven't made it a really good effort. Or they made an effort by themselves, but they didn't talk to God about it and do what he says. Or they made an effort, talked to God, but they didn't talk to a counsel about it. A lot of people don't receive counsel, and that's why relationships fails. And so people make major decisions, in particular in the relational area, when it's like a person who falls out of the boat into uh, white water. When you go white water rafting, you know what they tell you when you fall out? They don't say swim, you know, as hard as you can, try to get to shore, you know, save yourself. They don't say that. They just say, stick up your hand and wait for the captain to pull you into the boat. And see, sometimes we're making major decisions over something that's really important to the heart of God, and that's relationships, and we're not following, we're not following his lead. The second unifying point I want that brings us together is you have to embrace the diversity of unity. Embrace the diversity of unity. Now, in heaven, it's going to all be figured out, all be worked out. The Bible talks about this in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and following. I'm going to skip into it a little bit, but it says, when you're there, people are going to be there from every nation, from every tribe and people, and I love this, in all the different languages. So there's never going to be a better place, a better representation of unity than in heaven. But God wants us to have a little bit of heaven on earth. Come on, somebody, in the church of Jesus Christ. So, has it ever occurred to you that in order for there to be, uh, the, and there must be diversity, excuse me, there must be diversity for there to be unity? In other words, there, if, if everybody's just, if, if there's no diversity, then, then there's no need for unity because everybody's just the same. 
Everybody's just the same. What the heck would we need uh, uh, unity for, right? So unity, sometimes we understand it best by, un by looking at what it's not. It's not, it's not surrendering, you know, your opinion. You just can't have an opinion. You, you can't have a political view or beliefs or, or you have to have the same personality, right? Unity is not uh, uniformity. Everybody's the same. Unity is not union, where we're, we have to stay, or we're just connected, we're tied at the hip. No, unity is not, and, and I want to remind you of our big idea in this series, unity is not sameness of person, it's sameness of purpose. See, if we don't have a common purpose as a church, there will inevitably, eventually be conflict and lots of it. So that doesn't mean you check your brains at the door. That doesn't mean that the different things that you bring to the table, you can in turn bring to the table. No, in fact, when you have a common purpose, then you gain, not lose, from your differences. See, a lot of times couples fail because they're competing over their differences, not celebrate any, their, their differences. This was one of the biggest problems in Stacey and I's marriage uh, in the first part of our marriage. Now, oh, 30 years married now, right? And I always say it's been 20 awesome years. So do the math. There was some bad years in the beginning. She's got a different equation there. I think I was having more fun for longer. So she might say 15 years, but whatever. All right, you check with her on the map. There you have it, we have differences. But we have differences in everything. We are so different from each other, okay? I can't enjoy a sandwich until I clean everything up before I, make this, before I eat the sandwich. I've gotta put the mayonnaise away, I've gotta wipe down the dishes. I mean, seriously, clean them all up. I wanna sit down in like what I would call peace. Okay, now my wife's like, this is a beautiful sandwich. She makes her sandwich and she gets right after it. The kitchen can be what I would consider a disaster. She would just consider a temporary disruption. <laughs> we're different, okay? And, and we're different in how we, we look at uh, the lawn. I want the lawn in straight lines and I want my car immaculate. She could care less about the lines. Did you vacuum the house? You know, and, and my car is just creatively organized. We, we, we see things differently. We have different hobbies. We have different, uh, you know, I like loud music and fast driving. She likes it quieter and can we please slow the heck down. We're extraordinarily different and, and I've learned over time that those differences are what make us strong. It took me a long time to figure this out. Like my wife likes to do stuff when we go places. I like to just chill, okay? But I, I, I spent a lot of time in the beginning trying to bend her differences to mine. Instead, I've learned that God put her in my life, not for me to make her more like me. God knows we don't need more of me. We need a lot more of Stacy. And all the church said, amen. But I was meant, I was meant to learn from her. And she was meant to learn even and gain from me. And when I got that into this thick, you know, skull, life began to get better. We became one. We began to multiply our power. Through our diversity, we experienced uh, unity and new facets of life that I would never know if it were not for my wife. People and places and things and relationships and views and intuitive uh, insights and all spiritual revelations, all because I learned to celebrate our differences and stop trying to make her the same person. We have a common purpose, but we don't have to be the same person. And there's nobody, by the way, just as a shout out to my boo, there's nobody that's introduced Jesus more to me than you. And so I thank you for that. So what do we do in this cultural uh, timing that we're in as a society? I, the Bible's going to give us some instructions in Ephesians in just a minute, but I think we got to learn to kind of like maybe close our mouth a little bit more, be a little bit more humble, be a little bit better at listening. I heard one person say that, that uh, loving people feels like being heard. Loving people feels like being heard. I think we're so quick to, uh, to, we're not even listening to what people are saying. We're, we might be hearing them, but we're not listening. We don't really know what's, like we're not listening with our hearts. A lot of times I used to get in conflict with my wife because I listened to her words, but I wasn't, I wasn't hearing what was going on on the inside. And so when you come into relationship with a, with a humble posture, 
you get a different result. Humility, humility says, talk to me. Pride says, I want to talk to you about something. I want to tell you some things and I want to teach you some things. And so Paul, like last week we learned in 1 Corinthians, he basically said, we've got all these parts, the ear and the foot and the hand, and they're all supposed to come together to accomplish something bigger. But if we can't celebrate those differences, if we can't complement each other and come into a synergy, there's going to be problems. And so before I go to the next point, by the way, if you're sitting out there, do you know your gifts? Do you know the, the differences, the way God made you? Do you know your differences? That's why we go next steps every single week at Connect Church because one of the things we want to help people do, we help people know God, find freedom, but then discover purpose. And in that third step, by the way, you don't have to go in sequence. You can go to those steps every week. They, it just keeps running all the time. But the third one, we help you discover your gifts. Most people don't know what those are. When you discover your gifts and then you connect it with other people's gifts, you will feel God, you will grow, and you'll find your purpose. Now, last unifying thought. Number three, write this down. You have to accept the gift of unity. I know that's kind of different, but unity is a gift. It's first a gift from God. Now, I want to kind of come back to something we talked about last week a little bit a different way. We addressed one of the number one problems in our society today, and one of the things that keeps us from functioning as one body is this autonomous uh, predisposition that we have, in particular in America. It's like, you know, uh, uh, it's my body, I can do what I want to. You know, I'm large and in charge. I get to do what I want when I want. That's what it means to be autonomous. Now, we're living in a culture that is simply saying that underneath that, uh, let's say motto or mantra that people have underneath that or behind that is people have in our world today outside of Christianity they have this this uh, belief that that human beings have this capacity inside of them to to kind of change things if we could educate ourselves enough if we could if we could uh, uh, employ a certain plan or program if we could you know just get these people out of this environment and put them in this environment over there if we could just listen to each other better in the united nations we would have peace in our world in other words culture sees our biggest problem listen as a social problem Culture sees our biggest problem as a social problem. We got to work harder at, at, at understanding each other, and we got to have these peace talks, and there's going to be, this, we got to have some more empathy in our world for one another. And if we did, th these problems would be resolved. But if, listen to me now carefully, if you are a follower of Christ, you cannot and must not subscribe to this point of view because this is what we believe as Christ followers that because, because Christians recognize that all sin stems from a broken relationship. All sin stems from a broken relationship. And man, I, you, we, uh, of our, in and of ourselves cannot repair it. We are incapable of repairing this broken relationship outside of ourselves. Something, more importantly, someone outside of ourselves has to help us with this sin problem that caused this broken relationship. And it's greater than you and me, and we cannot overcome it on our own or in our own indiv individuality. And so you can't educate yourself enough. You can't get it through some social program, through some charitable uh, experience, through counseling, through therapy, you, some understanding, some, some, some insight. No, to have peace on earth, it's not going to happen. If you think that, you are, survey says, uh -uh. Exactly wrong. Exactly wrong. And that's why we see in our world today this notion comes out in different ways. Bumper stickers that say coexist. Do you know what's behind that bumper sticker coexist? It's behind, but behind that is the problem is a social problem. The problem is a social problem, everybody. And what's behind that is if we can just get in the room, if we can just talk it out, we can work it out. And if we can just care a little bit more, if we can just work a little harder, and if you can just do a little bit more over here, that not going to bring peace. It ain't going to happen, everybody. It's not going to do it. It's not, it's not a knowledge problem. It's a nature problem. It's a nature problem. So I think this is in your notes. Our problem is not a social problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem, and it's a problem greater than you and me. And that's why you and I need a Savior. We need a Savior. In fact, I wrote this in my notes. Unity, again, it's a gift of grace. It's a gift of grace. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. 
It's a little complicated and I'll try to make this fast. It says, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, these are people outside of God's covenant, and you're, you're, you are uncircumcised by those who call themselves circumcision. It's basically people who are not in faith and people who are in faith. And it's basically people who did things by their human effort and their works. It says, remember that at that time, this relationship and this arrangement you had, you were, as a person who didn't have that, separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in a covenant with, with God. Without hope, oh, that's bad and without God in the world. That's how this world is if it doesn't come to the realization and revelation that this is not a social problem, this is a spiritual problem. Paul is saying here and other places that the deepest division that we have in mankind is not war, it's not masks and viruses, it's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual divide. And the only way to, to, to bring this, this, this division into a resolution and to come into this agreement that they had back, back in the Old Testament, that Abraham once had back in the day because of his faith, because of this covenant he had, the only way to close this chasm between God and man is we're going to need some help on the outside. It's not going to be uh, uh, through uh, some cure. It's going to be through the cross. And so no education, no program, no funding is going to do that. Only God can do that. So that's why the Bible says in Ephesians 2, but now, everybody say now, now, parentheses, new deal, new covenant, new, new package, close parentheses, now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away, you who are way over there have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus got on the cross, that became the cure. That became the bridge for you that's far from God and you that's far from God and you who feel that distance and you who feel that division, whatever it was, he was bringing you close together. Come on, everybody. I hope you're getting this. If you really understood this, if you really came to the recognition that you're far from God and the only person that could bring you back is Jesus, there's hope. There's hope for you. There's, this is why the Bible calls it good news because Jesus bridged that gap that you could never cover. He built a bridge that you could never build. And the Bible says, for he himself is our peace and he's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in the flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one, this is amazing, new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Verse 16, and in one body, there's our message last week that really uh, relates to today, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. This is amazing. So Paul is saying in so many words, the deepest bond that we can share is when we are, he, he uses this word, in Christ. This word in Christ. See, the word Christian um, that we throw around all the time, um, that word Christian actually in the Bible is only used a couple of different times. In fact, it's used in a derogatory sense by people who weren't Christians. The most common word outside of, there's Christian, there's disciples, but the most common word to describe a Christian is someone who's in Christ. It's a relational term. It's someone who's been united with Christ. They're in Christ. That's what it means. And so therefore, when you come to that realization that you are now in Christ, there's a uh, response. What it means is now, before you're an American, before you're a Republican or a Democrat, before you're a business owner, before you're a man, or before you're a woman, you are now, this is what you got when you became a Christian, you are in Christ. And we carry all these categories into our life. We come from different demographics. We come from different parts of the world. We come from different cultures and experiences. But the thing that Christians should have that unifies them most is that we are in Christ. Christ Jesus. This is a huge concept, and if you believe this, you wouldn't be so prone to identify with different groups. All of those things, all of those ideas, all of those opinions, as a person who's in Christ, eventually you bow your knee to those things because you are first a citizen of another kingdom, of another world. You are first a part of something bigger than that. You are first united with a similar purpose. You are first connected to Christ. And so at some point, at some point for us to be united as a church 
Should I not talk about this again? You're gonna have to come to the point where you as an American, you submit and you surrender your, 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 your views. You submit your, your, your political views to Jesus. You submit your racial views to Jesus. You submit your family views. You're almost like homegrown religion to Jesus. You bow, you bow, you bow, and you, you get on your knee and you say, what does love require of me? What does Jesus require of me? What would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus respond? And when we, as a church, get there, where we're, we're on our knees, like that, together, in Christ, we're united. Now we're a united church because we are first in Christ. I'm gonna ask that the worship team come to all locations, come to the front, and uh, we're gonna pray in just a minute, but I want you to remember something before we transition. Unity is a gift, okay? And I'm gonna make a contrasting statement. Yes, it is a gift, and a lot of times we understand this idea that, you know, it's all by grace, it's all by grace, it's all by grace. And then we just chuck works out, we chuck effort out, we chuck, you know, I would say our part out because we exalt God's part, and God's part is first. Absolutely, no, no, no doubt about it, I am a grace person, but I am also a works person. So let me try to explain it in this text because we mess things up, especially as it pertains to unity. Ephesians 4 says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be humble, be gentle, with your spouse, by the way, with your parents, with, in your workplace. What if we did that? What if we did that on Facebook? Be patient, bearing one another in love. Then it says, make every effort. Everybody say effort. We often think that effort is a dirty word as New Testament Christians because we think it's all grace. Make every effort to keep, key word, but here's the balance to, to this thing. Keep, in other words, you didn't gain unity, it was given. You didn't gain it, it was given. But to, to keep it, you have to make effort for it. You didn't gain unity, God gave it to you. But if you're going to keep it, we're gonna to have to make an effort. Unity was a gift, but you certainly need to make efforts to stay united in Christ. So, last statement is this. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. You can't earn it, he just gave it to you. But it's not opposed to effort. So, friend. Wherever you are, I don't know where you are in your life today. I don't know where you're listening uh, from around perhaps the world, different regions, and certainly to the people that call Connect Home there locally. Listen, we are called to be one church, many locations. And if we become one church, we will answer Jesus' prayers because he'll say, now the world will know and they will believe. Pastors, campus pastors all over, I'm going to release you. Framingham, I'm going to release you. Ashland, I'm going to release you to the pastors there and also our Tri-County location. I love you guys. I'm going to see you real, real soon. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. God bless you.